So the title is Losing a spe Specialty. Uh, you have the subtitle of the Emergency Medicine Match, a warning to the profession of medicine. And, you know, the match itself is, is, you know, a symptom of the disease. So, you know, we're going to go over a little bit about how emergency medicine uh, was created and I'm calling the arc of emergency medicine. So it's a relatively new specialty. The very first residency was in 1970, and board certification wasn't available till 1979. And we were being told, I was told as a medical student that, oh, you know, you don't want to go into emergency medicine, you'll burn out, you won't be respected. Um, I was at a medical school that didn't have emergency medicine presence. Uh, I ignored that advice. I, you know, sought out the only residency program in the city of Philadelphia and Fortunately, Matt's there. But, you know, after the initial naysayers, we really started to grow, um, you know, through the 80s and 90s with academic departments. There was a clear recognition that we brought something to the table about the quality of care. I actually published a couple of articles on that myself. AEM has a white paper on the uh, how bo board certification emergency medicine has enhanced care across the board. And residency programs began to grow. Uh, you know, where it was shunned by a lot of other specialties. Next thing you know, like they started to rely on us. Um, so, you know, we thought we made it. Uh, people have been deans, CEOs. We have NIH funding. Uh, became a top specialty choice for students. Uh, at one point, I saw a statistic that two thirds of EM applicants were in the top third of the medical school class. I spent years as a program director uh, before becoming a chair here at Temple. And uh, I was, you know, riding that wave. It, it was pretty awesome. We had the, the best and the brightest joining us. But now we're in a profound crisis, um, which is, you know, part of what this forum is about, what Take Medicine's about. And this, this is basically, this is the graph, right? Emergency medicine residency applicants by year have plummeted uh, over the last two years, with this year being a real shakeup for the specialty. There were over 500 unfilled spots uh, pre-SOAP for people to know what SOAP is, you know, that's where you kind of scramble around to get. So this, this is just, you know, this is blowing everybody away, but, you know, if you think about it, it was probably predictable. So it's a twin killing. And I'm narrowed it down for the short time we have is, will I get a job? And will, is this a job I would want? I mean, this is what the students are are looking at. And uh, some of this was a self-inflicted. Some of it was pandemic related. But in the graduating class of 2021, uh, the pandemic was in full bloom and volumes across the country were um, reduced. There's a, actually a paper just came out about the economic impact on the specialty of emergency medicine, a volume drops, you know, cost billions of dollars to emergency physicians. Uh, but there were graduating residents who couldn't find a job. And that created a buzz, right? You know, social media among the students, concerns among academic programs, like what's actually happening. And then on top of that, the, the American College decided to publish a workforce study, which said, though, there's going to be an oversupply of 9,600 docs by the year 2030. And then, you know, with the the other kind of theme that's been going on is the use of non-physicians to replace doctors uh, by private equity. That was well, you know, out there on social media and, you know, the applicants to students see this kind of stuff. So that, that was something that corporate emergency medicine brought to the table of this, will I get a job question? And, you know, there's this evidence out there, right? You know, envision advertising, you know, contract with us because, APPs are two thirds the cost of doctors. I don't. Some people have probably seen this was in some articles and some publications. But American Physician Partners essentially, um, you know, was talking about we we need more money. They're going to the lenders, and I'm going to zone in here on just one area. One of the ways they're going to save money is staffing mixed changes. We're going to shift staffing between MDs and they call them MLPs. So the companies are saying, you know, we want the cheapest provider, you know, the best one to enhance the bottom line. So, of course, 
the specialty is well aware of this. And then the other side of the coin is, you know, this whole issue of, is this a job I would want? And the circle, the arc, the, it's been completed. Um, now people are being told again, don't go into emergency medicine. You're going to burn out. And there's really no strong arguments against that. Uh, you know, my personal belief is that in its purest form, you know, this is still the greatest specialty out there. I've had a great career. And, I, you know, there's a lot of us who could not have seen ourselves doing anything differently. And, you know, we feel it's been very rewarding. But the Medscape survey, we're the highest in burnout, 65%. You know, next highest is with 60%. Our attrition rate's gone from, you know, in the early years, in the 80s and 90s, some of the studies done by a guy named Ken Hall said it was 1.5% per year. Now, you know, the most recent study, which came out just after that workforce study, um, the workforce study used a 3% attrition rate. The study that came right after that said it's actually 5% or higher, um, which hey, that's good news. There's going to be more jobs because people are leaving. But the bad news is people are leaving at average of 20 years. You know, one out of 20 docs are deciding to quit the specialty per year. And then, you know, in, in this whole context, everybody knows it's a stressful specialty, right? And we've talked about that. I mean, shift work is the number one reason we choose it. It's the number one reason we leave nights, weekends, holidays, um, Certainly, as you age, shift work is very impactful. Uh, violence, you know, not only the violence that we see in society, but violence against physicians. It's it's rampant in the uh, emergency department. Nursing staff feels the same consequences, and, and and other folks feel this. And then the tragedies that that they all they fall at the door of the emergency department. The fentanyl crisis. I mean, ah, you know, there, there's so many cries of families who use lose young people. You know, you see that time and time again in, in the community that we serve. And it, it's just a high risk specialty, right? You, you have somebody come in with a complaint of chest pain and you've never met them before and you don't know much about them. And it's, you know, the, the scary things in emergency medicine is, you know, go home and die scenarios. Um, you know, we're the one of the few specialties to see kids die. Um, so it, it's inherently stressful. But, you know, we knew that and especially what's going on. But then we have corporate dominance happening in emergency medicine. And it's just been devastating in my view. It's a major contributor to our high burnout rate. And my premise is it's a difficult job, as we just mentioned, and you can't do that long-term if you feel you're being exploited. Okay, you feel that somebody is using you for, for their gain. You know, we know the doctors report loss of autonomy because they have to follow corporate directives. And that's across the board in terms of when physicians report moral injury slash burnout, whatever you want to call it, loss of autonomy. You know, I, I went into this to be a doctor to be responsible for my patients. And, and now I'm being told I can't do it. Financial exploitation, it's real. The bottom line is most of the M physicians never see what's paid in their name. They have no idea what the company is billing or collecting, and that just breeds a sense of distrust. You know, when I talk to residents, I have the Dalai Lama slide. I don't know if that's good to say anymore about the Dalai Lama after his recent troubles, but uh, it breeds distrust. They don't know what's going on. But they do know that if they're working for private equity, they want a 20% return on investment, and they're actually where it's coming from, that they are the ones producing the professional income. Emergency medicine is pretty straightforward. You know, we don't build the emergency department. We don't pay the electric bill. We don't hire the nurses. We don't even provide the EMR. It's the, the labors of the physicians and the non-physicians that they are profiting off of. And there's a widespread sentiment in emergency medicine that the senior physicians sold out the younger generation. They got multiple times EBITDA by these private equity companies who funded that with debt. They got their fat retirement check. And we're not only going to pay off the purchase price, but we're also going to fund the 20% return on investment. So this is a major devastating effect on our specialty. And then, you know, we had we heard from Senator Marshall, <clears throat> we have no due process. The, the corporate directive is, um, they say to hospitals, we will fire these doctors if you just give us the work. If they complain about inadequate nursing staff, inappropriate protocols, you know, 
just we'll get rid of them or, you know, we'll threaten them to the degree that uh, they'll change their behaviors. And obviously, this is going to affect patients, right? So first off, you know, that drop off, the best students have turned away from emergency medicine, a demanding specialty that treats uh, patients in their most vulnerable mo moments. The doctors who are burned out, those 65 percent, they're not at their best, right? You're going to work with burnout hanging over you. You just can't think right. You know, it's you're distracted. Uh, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in the, the distracted physician is not going to be there for, for patients in their time of need. And then again, this 20 percent attrition rate, I mean, the 5 percent attrition rate with 20 year careers, mid career doctors just leave it. They're saying, you know, I, you know, I'm nine, 10 years out. I'm at my best. I've taken my residency training. I've tempered it with experience. But, you know, this is not a long term specialty for me. The best doctors are not the one year graduate, the one year post residency or people my age, right? It's just, you know, you know that the best ones are those nine, eight, nine to 10 year doctors. And then the business <clears throat> influence is present. That wears on us <clears throat> and it affects the patient. So, you know, we're coerced to admit, to over test, to discharge undesirable patients, transfer undesirable patients. And the doctor fears speaking on your behalf as a patient. Uh, they could be terminated. I mean, Lynn, his story is right there uh, on behalf of the patients and of the staff. Uh, so the solutions, hey, this is what we're talking about. Taking medicine back, fighting private equity, um, corporate control. This is, you know, again, somebody had, in a prior session had asked about unions. Um, you know, I, I can't accept a state where the private equity and corporate control remains and then we accede to them by forming unions. I think this is, is key for us to realize that we, we've got to continue this fight. Obviously, due process, as Senator Marshall said, doctors should see what's being paid in their name. I would think the payers, the insurers and CMS would want us, the ones who are attesting to honest billings, would want us to actually know what they are. And hopefully all physicians will take up the call. All physician organizations will take up the cause that we have, you know, a multi-specialty effort now to take medicine back. I see that the veterinarians are involved. Co-op, same thing. Learner professions need to get get engaged in this. So, I think I hit right on ten minutes, and uh, I thank you for your attention.